It's the last mission, the final countdown. It's caramel chemistry. Now I was born and raised in Appalachia, so I'm gonna say caramel through this whole video. You might say caramel, but I'm not gonna. With all the stuff we've talked about in the last four videos, this is the one that's gonna bring all of that together. Hopefully. Well, here we all are again. Me, you, the board, sucrose. Feels good, right? After we get our sucrose up to its decomposition temperature, about 185 Celsius, the first thing that happens is the cleaving of this glycosidic bond, separating our glucose and fructose monosaccharide units. It happens from residual water that's hanging around on the sucrose anyway, being that sucrose is hygroscopic and all. So the water cleaves this glycosidic bond and we get our individual monosaccharide glucose and fructoses. Now from there, the glucose and the fructose react with each other and other pieces of themselves from different sucrose molecules in different ways than making just sucrose, and we get three main longer, bigger molecules called carmelan, carmelen, and carmelin. Now, if it didn't sound to your ear like there was any difference whatsoever in those, I'll draw them out for you. And by draw them out, I mean I'm just going to put the molecular formula. You can see carmelan here with an A, carmelen with an E, and carmelin with an I. Those are the only difference in the words there, so if you had a hard time hearing it from my weird Appalachian dialect, that's probably why. On the molecular formula side, though, as much as we know about caramel, or we think we know about caramel, we don't really know the structure of these molecules, so this is kind of the best I can do for you here. At the same time, what I like to do is instead of thinking about the raw numbers of the carbons here, we talk about carbohydrate units. So we have glucose and fructose, both six carbon monosaccharides, even though in the linear form the glucose has an aldehyde where the fructose has a ketone, Still have six carbons. So for carmelan C12, we have two carbohydrate units. Carmelan C24, we have four. And for carmelin, those of you excellent at math, we have a total of, yes, six carbohydrate units. Now, the way I like to think about this comes from a paper from the ACS Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry from 2012 called Unraveling the Chemical Composition of Caramel. Now, in there, in the abstract, because I'm not rich and don't have money to pay for that full article, they talk about these different units, and they were using mass spec combined with targeted liquid chromatography tandem mass spec experiments. Again, I didn't see the full paper, but anyway, in this abstract here, it says caramel is composed from several thousand compounds formed by a small number of unselective and chemoselective reactions. Caramelization products include ligamers with up to six carbohydrate units. Aha, caramelin has 36 carbons, C66, six oligomer, I like that formed through unselective glycosidic bond formation. Now that says to me that for glucose and fructose, at least in the linear or cyclic forms, we have all those OHs that could react, both primaries and secondaries. Think back to that synthesis of sucralose. So unselective, any one of those OHs could react with any other OH from a different monosaccharide unit. So this C36 has a ton of potential isomers. We're talking, you know, six to the whatever power, a lot of different possibilities abilities here. So that's probably a decent idea why it's very difficult for us to try to figure out the exact molecular structure of these compounds. Finally, we look at dehydration products of oligomers losing up to a maximum of eight water molecules. That's why if you look in here, the ratios from C6, H12, O6 are off a little bit. We have 12 carbons and nine oxygens, 24 and 13, 36 and 24. So obviously we're losing water in there. The same applies to the hydrogens, obviously and hydration products of sugar oligomers, disproportionation products, and colored aromatic products. So that, my friends, is what caramel actually is. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? Okie dokie, those are the big molecules where we take sucrose, glucose, and fructose, put them together and make larger stuff. Here we're gonna talk generally about the decomposition products where we take our molecules and have basically fewer than six carbons. The three I wanna talk about are ethyl acetate, diacetyl, and maltol. Ethyl acetate, as you can see, has four carbons and this ester group here, and it gives kind of a fruity flavor to the caramel. Ethyl acetate is used as an organic chemistry solvent and it's considered very green. green meaning environmentally friendly, not necessarily the color green. I don't really care for the smell of this one, even though it supposedly gives caramel a fruity flavor, but as far as the green goes, it's generally considered the second most green solvent after water, and it's what you'll find primarily in a lot of the non-acetone-based fingernail polish removers. 
Moving on to diacetyl, you can see it has two of these ketones, backbone right next to each other, and maltol is this six carbon, almost like a recombination rearrangement of glucose or fructose where it does have this diene here, these two alkene double bonded carbons with the carbon in the middle. Interesting point about diacetyl and maltol is they're both very prevalently found in beer and fermented alcoholic products. So those two you will absolutely see again in some preceding videos on that nectar of life. So. Keep an eye out for that. Now let's bring it full circle. We know that sucrose, and to a very similar extent, glucose and fructose will caramelize. They will recombine, they'll make bigger molecules, they'll decompose, they'll make smaller molecules, where eventually everything just turns into that beautiful brown viscous liquid that is so, so good. But the question is, can fake sugars caramelize? And if they can't, why not? That's what brought this whole video series together, and I think the answer just might lie in a red hot ball of nickel. As the name would suggest, there's a YouTube channel where a person takes a red hot ball of nickel and drops it on stuff to see what would happen. The one I'm referring to has three different artificial sweeteners tested. Splenda, remember sucralose, sweet and low, saccharin, and Truvia, a combination of erythritol and stevia side. There is a major catch to this, however. Because the sucralose in Splenda and the saccharin in sweet and low are so much sweeter than normal table sugar sucrose, you have to have what's called a bulking agent just to make up that volume. Otherwise, you'd be trying to put one or two two crystals of sucralose on your food, and that's just impractical. The trouble is, the bulking agent that they have is called dextrose. Well, that's just another fancy name for glucose. So the experiment that you see is really just Splenda and Sweet and Low. It's practically the same thing. It's just glucose reacting with the ball of nickel. And as you would expect, the glucose basically just caramelizes. You see it turn brown and bubble and then eventually over caramelize and just turn into a giant black ball of soot. With the Truvia experiment, however, that does not happen. In fact, two completely different weird things happen. The first is that a pile of what appear to be strings start to shoot out of the pile of stuff so much that the camera operator actually has to back up while filming the video. The second is near the end of the experiment, instead of having just a pile of charred blackness around the ball, the ball is sitting in a pool of liquid. So what I have here finally talking about the board are the melting points in Celsius of these five different sugar slash, slash fake sugar artificial sweeteners. Sucrose, glucose, fructose, erythritol, and steviaside. So erythritol and steviaside both live in Truvia. And you can see that their melting points really aren't that different. They're certainly in the same ballpark as sucrose, glucose, and fructose. So what is it about erythritol and steviaside that doesn't or can't caramelize, whereas sucrose, glucose, and fructose absolutely will? I'm gonna give you a possible explanation. I don't know if this is true, but it's my guess. Because glucose and fructose can exist in both a linear and a cyclic form, and because in the disaccharide sucrose form, and I'm pretty sure in each of the caramel forms, caramelan, caramelan, and caramelin, they are in the cyclic form. Steviaside and erythritol, I don't think can exist in a cyclic form. Now that also branches out more so into the other sugar alcohols like glycerol, xylitol, uh, sorbitol, and mannitol, also into some of the other ridiculous other fake sugars like saccharin, ACE K, sucralose, etc. I don't think they can exist in that cyclic form, and that might be part of why they don't caramelize. To explain the pool of stuff at the end of the video, well, if they're not going to caramelize, if they're not going to turn into other things, maybe they're just going to absorb all the energy of that nickel ball and turn into melted stuff. 121C and 198C, absolutely well under the temperature of that red hot nickel ball. The other piece of it, with the weird shooting strings that are coming out of the screen, maybe the erythritol can't caramelize, but could it polymerize? That is to say, could we take these, and much like the six carbohydrate unit oligomers of carmelin, we could take the erythritol and get one, two, three, four, five, a thousand of those that rapidly connect to each other, and that's what creates the weird shooting things that come out of the screen. Again, total guess, just my opinion, but that's what I'm going with. And that brings the great sugar odyssey to a close. We talked about regular carbohydrates, sugar alcohols, kind of fake sugars and really fake sugars, and how all of that applied to the chemistry of caramelization. See you next time.